Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I do appreciate you being with me. Okay, we are continue our, continuing our study of Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. Matthew 25, 31 and following is the time of the harvest. Harvest is the resurrection. That is also the time of the gathering of the nations. You know, that connecting those dots is just simple. And it is, it is irrefutable. You know, we, we cannot ignore these, uh, th these concepts and motifs. Just the other day, I, I was reading where individuals were saying, well, this word or that word is not found in a given text. And my response to that is, just because a given word is not in a text doesn't mean the doctrine is not there. If you have the day of the Lord, you do not have to have in that text a statement about the judgment. You do not have to have a statement about rewards of salvation or condemnation because those are inherent fundamental tenets and elements of the day of the Lord. I, and I keep mentioning this. It's all about hermeneutic, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about hermeneutic. Okay, two continues here. I, I mentioned yesterday that I wanted to do a proper examination and exegesis of the correlation between Matthew chapter 13, 39 through 43 and Daniel chapter 12. Let me remind you, let me read again Matthew chapter 13, 39 to 43, one of Jesus' very first parables. And this is a critical parable because of what Jesus asked his apostles after he told the parable and after he explained the parable. So, verse 39 and following. The enemy who sowed them, sowed the tares, is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Son of man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Those who practice lawlessness, those, and they will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then... Then, that word is critical, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Let the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, as virtually all critical scholars agree, some to greater degree than others, it's kind of interesting to me uh, that Gregory Beale says there is only a possible allusion to Daniel chapter 12. In Matthew 13, only a possible allusion. Uh, it seems to me that it's possible, distinctly possible, that uh, Mr. Beale saw a train coming. In Daniel chapter 12, and obviously I'm not going to go into detail in every single verse, but in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 foretold the great tribulation, such as has never been. Verse 2. Then the righteous, or excuse me, then at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth. Oh, wait a minute, that's resurrection. Now, I'm only going to mention this in passing, but this prediction, the time of the great tribulation, is associated with the concept of the judgment, which is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish feast days, and on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, according to Jewish thought, practice, and doctrine, the books, God's books, were opened. Now, we have reference to God's books throughout the Tanakh. So it's not, you know, that's not a conjured up doctrine. So here we have, in the very first two Verses of Daniel chapter 12, 
the concept of the Jewish feast days being fulfilled because we then have Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall arise, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting condemnation. That's resurrection. That's the harvest. That's the full, that is Sukkot. The last of Israel's feast days, which would occur, which would occur at the end of the age. The Jews understood that. That's what they taught. Okay, got to hurry. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and condemnation. Those who are wise, watch this, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Wait a minute. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds familiar. Because it's the ground and the source, it's the fountain for Matthew 13, 43. Now watch this. You, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall increase. By the way, knowledge being increased, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has nothing to do with the Internet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was on a radio program some years ago. The host was dispensational. And she loved to have me on. She had a love-hate relationship with me. She just could not fathom preterism. And she lo loved to challenge me. It was all friendly. And <laughs> uh, one night she said, okay, Mr. Preston, you keep talking about everything fulfilled in A.D. 70. And she appealed to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. And it says, knowledge shall be increased. And they shall run to and fro. She said, there's never been a time in all of our history in which knowledge has increased more than it's increasing now. We are doubling our, our uh, knowledge database every 90 seconds, or so she claimed. So she said, how do you explain that? That has to do with the computer age. And I said, no, ma'am, it really doesn't. Here's the reason why. The knowledge that would be increased was the inspired knowledge and the understanding of God's Word. In the last days, when the prophetic office would be restored, according to Daniel chapter 9, and then come to an end, at the destruction of Jerusalem. And she just literally exploded. She said, where in the world do you get that? She said, I've never heard of such a thing in all of my life. And she said, or I, I then said, oh, let's look at verse 9. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. That's the increase in knowledge. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 told his apostles, when you, not some generation 2,000 years off, but when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the one who reads understand. Now Daniel said, I heard the vision, but I didn't understand. But Jesus said his apostles would see the events that he was foretelling, they would see, they would understand. <coughs> but I must hurry. Notice that Daniel is told that the righteous would shine forth as the stars in the firmament at the time of the end. Now, it's fascinating and significant that the term the end here is from a cognate of Suntalia to Aeonion. It is from a cognate of that. In other words, it's a related concept. They are not two different ends. At the end of Daniel chapter 12, the time of the harvest, which is Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, which is Matthew chapter 25 verse 31 and following. Everyone agrees Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is the resurrection, right? Okay, so Matthew chapter 12 the time of the harvest, time of the resurrection, 
is at the end of the age of Daniel chapter 12. Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, is the time of the harvest at the time of the gathering of the nations at the end of the age. Same identical subject. Well, in verse 6 of Daniel chapter seven, uh, 12, Daniel said us that he had seen two men. One of the men said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? When are these things going to be fulfilled? Put that in good old Oklahoma vernacular. Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and forever, it shall be for a time, times, and a half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be fulfilled. You know, it stuns me at times how desperate people get to avoid the power of this text. Some people appeal to a, an ultra, ultra, ultra minority translation that says the, when the power of the destroyer has been destroyed, these things will be fulfilled. Well, as the vast majority of Hebraists point out, that is not a supported translation. Or secondly, as Mr. Kyle Pope did recently in my review of his book, Thinking About A.D. 70, he says, well, you have to understand in verse 6, the question is only about when shall these wonders be fulfilled. That limits the application. And then in verse 7, when it says, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things are fulfilled. And he says, well, you see, we have to understand that the word all doesn't always mean all. Well, that's obviously true, but you, you <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you cannot destroy the meaning of all in this text by applying or appealing to a different text that is in a different context discussing different things. That's an illegitimate totality transfer. It is an abuse of exegesis and hermeneutic. Now, very quickly, who were Daniel's holy people? Was well, Old Covenant Israel. Point number two, when was the power, or what was the power of Old Covenant Israel? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it was never their army. It was never their military might. The only reason that one could put a hundred to flight, Deuteronomy 32, is if the Lord was with them. And if the Lord was with them in covenant blessing, they could overcome any, any army. Israel's power, her only power, was her covenant relationship with Yahweh. So when was Israel's covenant with Yahweh completely shattered? Well, a lot of people try to tell us it was at the cross. Sorry, that's not accurate. Because the resurrection and the great tribulation and the end of the age would be when the power of the holy people is shattered. Let me ask you, did the resurrection, not Jesus' resurrection, did the resurrection of the just and the unjust happen at the cross? No, it did not. Oh, by the way, some people try to tell us all of those things refer, oh, except verse 2, uh, refer to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Was Israel's covenant relationship with Yahweh completely shattered at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, no. <sighs> Pardon me. It was not. If anything, it was revived because of the Maccabeans, because of the 
sons of thunder, not, uh, excuse me, the hammer of Israel, hammer of Yahweh. It is simply wrong to say that Israel's covenant relationship with Israel were shattered at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. There's only one time that that is applicable. And that was in AD 70, the time of the Great Tribulation, you know, the Jewish War. That is the time of the gathering. That was the end of the age. Remember, the apostles linked the destruction of Jerusalem, i.e., time of the Great Tribulation, with the end of the age. Unless you can prove the apostles were ignorant, confused, or just simply wrong. Then they were right. And I proved they were right in my book that I've mentioned. Okay. So what do we have? Daniel chapter 12. Time of the harvest. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. At the end of the age. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 25. The gathering of the nations, the time of the judgment, at the time of the harvest, i.e. the resurrection, at the end of the age, Daniel chapter 12, the end of the age, the resurrection harvest would be when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. Matthew chapter 25, therefore, the gathering of the nations, the time of the harvest would be and was when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. I'm completely out of time. <laughs> As usual, thanks for joining me. I'll see you on the flip side.